Right. So sorry for those listeners that are just joining us on the recording. You missed the intro, but I'm going to begin with the poem. Follow your name. Pay attention. Pay attention. Be careful not to distract yourself from yourself by focusing on the obstacles in your life. Focus on the delivery of your medicine, not on the stories in your head where you recount your limitations or losses. Do not indulge in such self-importance as a way to avoid taking responsibility for your medicine and the gift of healing you came here to offer. You are the heroes and the heroines of your own story. And if you are not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living in existence that is not entirely your own. And the story that you know you must live is the one standing just a few paces in front of you, looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide waiting for you to remember. Apprentice yourself to yourself and walk to the horizon of your own dreams, the place where you live in the absence of stories, the place where you where the sharp edges of this unfolding moment demand your full attention. Where are you? I am here, you say. Who are you? I am this moment, you reply. Pay attention, pay attention. Stay humble, remain focused. Do not move through your life in such a way as to allow another, another to give you a name you have no belonging to. Pay attention. Pay attention. Stay humble and remain focused. Do not move through your life in such a way as to allow another to give you a name you have no belonging to. So it's a poem that speaks of the, the, the broader context of rites of passage and the necessity for them. As I say, if you're not, if you're not initiated into the awareness of your own mythology, modernity will offer you its mythologies. And it's often filled with words that end with ISM or ism, ISUMs. And uh, so the necessity for rites of passage, especially in this day and age, uh, is quite great. Uh, however, this particular uh, discussion is for the guide. Um, and I'm going to talk about a, a, a training program that we offer here at Rites of Passage Council for, for guides. But it's for those, uh, like some of your questions, those interested and called toward guiding others through those uh, uh, the sense of the soul. And um, so one of the questions... I want to go back to my question and answers to get them all, I think. One of the questions around holding space, uh, creating rites of passages for others and for yourself. Um, so in a, in a more traditional context, um, one would not have created a rite of passage for themselves. Um, although we do the best we can in these days uh, where there's an absence of uh, useful elders and initiated people. Uh, but the idea being that when one enters the, the realm of, of uh, the, the unknown and even the unknowable, it requires a guide, a guide that has at least navigated such territory in their own life. Um, and often rites of passages for others when you're when you're a guide, one of the signature things that I listen to hear for from somebody that tells me they're right on the edge or they're in the midst of it is, and it sometimes comes through with tears in their eyes and they say, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And it's like, now, now you're at the place that you're ready. First one has to not know. Um, they have reached the, the end of their own uh, resourcefulness and intellect and uh, being able to choreograph their life. And they've come to a place where they don't know. And so 
Uh, like in the story of Jumping Mouse, that's where Raccoon interfaces with Mouse. Mouse is hearing this roaring in his ears and he can't make out what it is and nobody else in, in Mouse Village seems to even notice it. And so jump, and so this little mouse goes out looking to figure out what this sound is. And he runs into Raccoon. And, uh, and first he's, it scares the shit out of the little mouse. And then Raccoon says, little, little brother, what, what are you doing out here? And the uh, mouse says, well, I, I hear this roaring in my ears and I don't know what it is and nobody else seems to be able to hear it. And I thought I would come out and find what it is. And, and I don't know what it is. And Raccoon says, well, little brother, that is the sacred river. And I know where it is and I will take you there and show it to you. And so he, the raccoon guides a little mouse to the sacred river and essentially turns him over to frog. And the, the whole story begins to unfold. And in the story, raccoon then wanders off to get something to eat. Um, and in the ways of uh, ceremonial rites of passage or initiation, this is a conversation for those that are interested in becoming uh, raccoons, as I call them ceremonial midwives, those that that catch those people out there looking for a trailhead, looking for a new uh, 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 a compass bearing to somewhere on a forgotten map um, or somebody whose old maps no longer work anymore in there. No matter what they try and do with the old maps, they don't take them anywhere useful. And so this is for the one interested in guiding and how to um, put uh, the initiate in touch with the sources of wisdom, guidance, love, and compassion that can guide them on their way. Um, one of my teachers, Meladoma Somme, uh, out of West Africa, remember he told me one time, he said, if I could teach you everything I know, it would amount to this much. Maybe, maybe that would be half of what it would be. <laughs> Uh, but if I can teach you something about the things that have come to teach me in my life and you be in relationship with those things, then you have an endless resource of, of support and wisdom and guidance. And I think that's the essence of guiding. That's the essence of um, that question about containers. Um, like when... If the one who's guiding ceremony is not connected in sourcing their guidance from something greater than their own charismatic personality, that's a dangerous situation uh, waiting to go awry. Um, and so it is the, uh, the relationship of the guide to those other sources of guidance that help them navigate and to see the things that they alone can't see and to hear the things they alone can't hear and to be able to say the words that need to be spoken at any one time comes from relationship uh, with those allies, with those guides. Um, and, uh, and the question about guiding oneself, I think we can, we can, um, how to say this, we can, off, we can bring ourselves to a lot of healing under our own guidance and, and under our own choreography of, of situational guidance. Um, but you can't know what you don't know. And, um, and so the kind of guides or the teachers that I'm, that I'm always interested in are the ones that, that can help me know the things I don't know I don't know. It's like that's a whole nother area of information and resource that I don't even know to ask about. Um, and so when you're guiding yourself, you don't have access to the things you don't know you don't know. You can only think about the things you don't know. Um, and so having a connection with uh, your guides is an important piece, but also elders and, and people that, uh, and, and with some human skin, as we say, that have navigated the territory uh, maybe numerous times um, through those dark nights or those, you know, descents of the soul um, that can help us to find ways to navigate. Um, 
because when you're broken open by life um, and you're in that place of, I don't know what to do, and you find yourself at a trailhead, um, it's helpful to have a guide. Um, and if you're only navigating through the territory of what you know, there's a, a, a likelihood of navigating yourself into just a, a newer, shinier version of the same thing that you know. Um, and so those are my thoughts on um, when uh, sometimes people ask me, well, I could, uh, uh, I could do a vision quest. I could just go out on the mountain and I'll fast for four days and nights. And I said, well, that's, that's not exactly what that ceremony is. Um, that's only one little phase of the ceremony. Um, the, the four days and nights on the mountain is such as, as I, I say, that's the easiest part. Getting to the, the threshold circle from where you are, that's the hardest part. And the next hardest part is coming back. And so that's where you need your village to help you prepare, help you do ceremonies of preparation and begin to orient your, often our, our Western modernized mind of how we conceptualize uh, ceremony more from a retreat kind of perspective um, into something that it was meant to be understood as as say these um, ceremony and ritual is not something that you do uh, simply for yourself um, it is something you do for your community um, so going up on the mountain or even putting people up on the mountain as a guide um, you put those people on, up on the mountain and you thank them for going up on the mountain for you as a guide because they're going up on the mountain to remember more of who they are so they can come back and feed their people. Um, and so there's this, this understanding that um, that rites of passage, initiation, rituals like this, uh, we're, not, we're not done for simply yourself. Um, that's not how uh, early cultures would think about these things. It was always done for the collective, the human and non-human peoples. And um, so in that greater context, guiding requires uh, having elders that support the guide and also have the guide having a deep relationship with uh, the other than human allies that support them. Um, when they're not uh, when they're not able to simply do it by themselves. Um, so containers. <clears throat> one more ish thing about the question about uh, containers. Uh, because we don't live in a for most of us we don't live in a um, a culture of unbroken um, ritual community. Um, where ceremony and ritual is something that just wove in and out of daily life. It didn't kind of like, it often just didn't begin. It was just part of life. Um, but in Western culture, we need this thing called containers. And we need this precise way that, okay, now we're stepping in and we're, we're differentiating and delineating between this and this, and we're stepping in with this intention. And now we're holding space in this way. And then we end uh, with a real clear, precise uh, ending to the container. So there's a clear container since our lives don't offer that uh, the way they would have for, for indigenous communities. Um, so the container for, for most of us becomes essential. Um, is that a question? A container that... Um, involves invocation uh, at the beginning. Um, so it's clearly not simply, as I say, the personality of people running things and a container that has enough space within what happens between when you begin and when you end so that the mystery can come in. Um, what we call, there's a popular word called uh, status ritual. Uh, Michael Mead might have coined the phrase. I don't know exactly who coined it, but there's this thing called status ritual and radical ritual. Mm -hmm. Status ritual is that which is predictable and choreographed from start to finish. There's no, no real question about what's going to happen. And you just go through the motions. Um, 
there's no room for for spirit to get in there because yeah. you've choreographed it. Radical ritual is once you step in the container, um, aside from there being loose choreography, your job now is to pay attention um, because things begin to ha happen that you need to be able to pay attention to. And that's where the mystery and the radical experience comes in when you have that spaciousness in, in the middle of uncertainty and unknown. Um, another reason why it's hard to choreograph uh, your own uh, rite of passage, um, because you need you need a container that gives you an experience where you you find yourself in the unknown. Um, something's holding you other than yourself. Um, and I think another question had to do with age and gender. <clears throat> um, depends on what kind of rite of passage. I think Bill asked that question. Um, there's lots of different ways to create rites of passage. You know, I'm talking about more of a traditional prayer fast or hill walking or vision quest, as it's sometimes known. <laughs> um, but rites of passage can be adapted to someone's, uh, you know, individual capabilities. <laughs> and um, in gender, um, these days, <clears throat> that's such a such an interesting word that that all of a sudden disappears. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, I find myself more interested in someone's story than someone's identified gender. Um, I know one time Melodoma said, oh, we've got like eight or nine and y'all are struggling with two or three or four. <laughs> but that would be kind of freeing. We, we can just take our focus off that. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if there was more to the question uh, of gender other than maybe receptivity and honoring and, and, uh, um, and someone's personal way of belonging to the world and themselves is up to, up to them to define. And um, uh, my question, regardless of how they belong to the world or define themselves, is, I would say, is it is it a is it a belonging that, in my way of saying it, is it a belonging that grows corn? Does it feed you and your people? this way of belonging to the world that you have. Um. KR, I was thinking of, uh, since I'm an old guy, there are a lot of old men that I know who've never been initiated in any way. And is there a way to do initiation when somebody's over 50, over 60, over 70? Oh yeah, we can put them out on the mountain for four days and nights. <clears throat> um, which I, you, I think the oldest stuff put out is 72. Would you change anything to do that? Um, it, you know, in in, um, in my teachings, the, the, the way that I work with people, say they're coming to a uh, an encampment. It's a, like a 12-day encampment. And within that 12 days, there's a four-day, four-night fast. <clears throat> there are three... Um, three taboos, as we call them among guides, that the initiate is going to uh, focus on. And one has to do with fasting, one has to do with solitude, and one has to do with exposure. So sometimes given a particular person's uh, uh, abilities or age or even medical condition, um, we might um, adapt fasting, exposure, or solitude, one of those things, or maybe a couple of them to make it, uh, to give them that experience without having to abandon the whole experience. Um, and I've done uh, adaptations with people within the, within the, the uh, program, um, more often around, uh, probably more often around exposure pieces. Um, than the fasting and the uh, solitude, although I have made slight shifts in those to make it, you know, tolerable. Um, so there is ways to work with it. And they're also individualized. Um, like some of my staff 
specialize more of, you know, if someone can't do these bigger programs, they're willing to to meet with you online and, and actually create your own individual experience and they'll they'll guide it for you. Um, but it'll be like specific to you instead of part of a, a group. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions for a shift? Or did I get the questions? I think I got bills and I got the container one, um, holding space one. Any other questions about those things? Well, I'm interested in um, what you were discussing about the name that is given as map, as medicine. And for those of us maybe who are not a part of the community or the communities that we're a part of don't have that as an element, you know, how can we, how can that name find us? Oh, wonderful question. I love the, uh, uh, the aliveness and the animism of the name finding us because <clears throat> often that's how it works. Um, it's uh, it's not, uh, I found very often it's uh, people's naming or renaming rather is something that often finds them as opposed to something they thought out and kind of did some research on and then chose a certain one. Um, so it's, um, and often the names are given by others, by like in, in sometimes in a traditional sense, an elder after hearing your story of your rite of passage, the elder would hear the story and not always, but maybe in the story, they, they would say, I hear, I hear this name and I hear it embedded in the story that you're telling me. Um, and so when you don't have those things, I think the first thing is simply to become conscious of is that the, does the name you carry carry you in a good way um, would be my first question. Does the name you carry carry you in a good way? Um, or is there uh, some work that needs to be done with that name? Doesn't mean to abandon your name, but sometimes people don't know um, the medicine of even any name that they might have. Um, but every name you, you're, you're your birth name is a, a particular energetic frequency and signature that, uh, um, that identifies you. Um, and I don't mean just uh, to, your, to, the, uh, to the DMV. I mean, um, that identifies you energetically, that inscribes you with certain elemental signatures based on the lettering. Um, and I find when people shift names, uh, it's always interesting to look at um, what that name calls out in them. So if I looked up here on the screen, I'm going to switch over to page two for a minute since, oh, there's less of y'all on page two. There's more names and less people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so scanning some of these names, if I was to speak a name that I see in front of me, um, that would ask you to actually I'll do this with a face because I know that there's a, a, a person connected to it I'm not sure when there's just a name if the person's there um, let me find a, a name here mm. okay so Fern I'm going to pick on you <laughs> So I'm going to say your name, and may, I'm just going to work with the, the first name you have there. But what I want you to do is notice inside yourself what feels like it's called forth in you. Um, so notice what, turn in your mindfulness attention to yourself, and notice thoughts, feelings, physical sensations when you hear the name Fern, Fern. And notice how the, the sound of your name meets your awareness. And if there's a contraction or expansion or something else that happens. Um, and it's often by 
that little little exercise of using uh, mindfulness with self and having somebody else speak our name that we can actually maybe sometimes for the first time notice, hmm, I feel this evoked or called up in me when I hear that name or I feel myself recoil and I never noticed that before. Um, or the, you know, like a, a an easy shift. And I'm gonna pick on somebody else. When you go from Allison to Allie, <laughs> as Allison did in her in her name. I don't know if she's there. I know her mic is turned off. Um, it's a slight shift, but it, it speaks to something different being called out in the person. Um, and so it's something you can try on with, with your own name, having somebody else speak it, and you just mindfully notice what shows up all by itself in yourself when you hear your name. Um, can I yes. tell you a story? Oh, yeah, what happened? Well, uh, growing up with fern was difficult. I got called bush, tree, plant, weed, everything but fern. So uh, around about 30... Yeah, about 33, 34, I changed my name, took over my, my middle name, mm -hmm. Anna Marie. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when I was 50, it just came to me that I didn't have to be Anna Marie anymore. And I went back to Fern. Mm -hmm. And suddenly people were saying, wow, what a beautiful name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I feel very good with the name Fern now. Mm -hmm. So names as associated with rites of passage, let me kind of bring it back into the context of initiatory passages, <clears throat> that to, uh, to go up on the mountain and return from the mountain, you, the proper way to, to bring somebody back into the village as it, as, is as if you have never met them before. You don't know who they are really. Um, you don't even know what their name they have. Um, and so you greet them as if they're, uh, not as if, you greet them as the mystery that they truly are. Um, and it's a way of um, allowing uh, more of who they are to actually be visible to you. Um, so this way of maybe there is a new name. Uh, maybe something was conferred on them just by their experience in nature. Maybe they're um, maybe you hear one evoked in their story when they share their story with you. Um, but the ceremony itself is a death and rebirth ceremony, a rite of passage. So the idea that one uh, embodies uh, a newness uh, upon their return um, that calls forth from them, and this is the important part, calls forth from them um, what it is that they want to bring to the world. <clears throat> and um, some of you out there, I, I, I know that I see your names and I know your, your other name, I know your medicine name that I know you by as well. I won't speak that. Um, but also know that in those situations, for those of you that I see out there that I know have a, another name, um, also have, a, have an experience with you of what that tends to call out in you. Um, and, and often it's uh, something that the, you know, something the world needs, something that your community needs, something that you came into this world to deliver. Um, so that's a, a context of names in relation to initiatory passages. Um, so any other general questions? Uh, I wanna move and, and talk more directly about um, our training program and how that yes. works. Um, yes, I have a question. Yes, Anne, what is it? Okay. Um, so I just have a question about like symbol, like signs, symbols, synchronicities on like the journey. Um, like when you have them like frequently, like I know sometimes I have them like very, very frequently, let's say a week, it'll be like constant, mm -hmm. but just in general, like um how do we differentiate like between like maybe the universe trying to tell you something versus like maybe the universe or source trying to 
um, move you along another to something more or just in general like how do you see those things um in this path in Mexico um trying to think of a uh, a way to incorporate a concise answer <clears throat> so when you're picking up when you say signs I guess you mean physically seeing something um uh there are different levels of information. One is that um, the internal map, we can take more of the psychological map, which is there's parts of our, our psyche and our consciousness that um, is uh, wishing to be acknowledged and, and therefore it will, will target certain things to call your attention. Uh, to those aspects of yourself or that you're moving towards. Now that's a very um, human centric way of thinking about it just in terms of it's being generated from your projections, but it is one place. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna dismiss the, the power of psychology and projection. Um, and then there are other places that have uh, little interest in your projections <laughs> or don't need them necessarily. Um, that can put things in front of you that are really beyond explanation, not something you were thinking about or would have ever thought about or um, uh, and yet there it is. And um, and sometimes it can be a little of both and that can be a little uh, a tricky. Um, the other thing with signs is uh, instead of asking the question, um, because we we're often um, and I can I have the freedom to say this since I've been schooled pretty thoroughly in psychology, <clears throat> we we live in a in a in a world where things uh, like the the end result of some understanding of something is to have some kind of psychological construct of understanding it as if that's the end that's the kind of the place you want to arrive at and clearly there are allies and forces of of uh influence that have little regard for um for your projections um or your or being psychologized um and and, but because we have that tendency to psychologize things, often the, the first question we ask is, what does that mean? How many times can you think about, I had a dream, what does that mean? Had this, had this encounter, had this uh, synchronistic thing happen, what does that mean? <clears throat> and um, as if meaning were some finite construct of, of information we could cloak with something and put it on a shelf and there it remains in that in that box forevermore however meaning is as fluid as water or water as my ancestors would say it meaning is fluid it's not fixed and so as i learned from my indigenous teachers i said don't waste your time asking about meaning because meaning is going to shift and move around like a river. Ask yourself the question, in light of this experience, what action am I guided to take? And I don't mean with your life. I mean like now. Uh, this is, it's, it's a process I call activating a conversation with the sacred. Because when you ask the question, in light of this experience, what action am I guided to take? You're immediately entering into a, um, a relational conversation of interaction with, with the unknown, with the sacred. And I say, as long as the action is within your integrity and your, and your current value system and doesn't, or at least doesn't jeopardize too much of your value system at that time uh, and, doesn't, and doesn't create harm, Take the action and watch what happens. 
Um, one, watch if energy doesn't come to you, like you feel a, an influx of energy. Um, two, when I say don't ask the question, what action am I guided to take with my life? Because that's just way too big. <clears throat> ask the question um, and then keep it close in in time and space. The closer in in time and space your, react, your response is, like what action am I to take with this, the less likely it will make sense and the more likely it will surprise you when you do it. Um, so I know that doesn't, uh, that's a way of, uh, I'd say that's a way, Anna, being in conversation with those experiences um, that will help you, guide you through um, following uh, the important threads and rather than the unimportant ones. Um, <clears throat> so anything else before we shift to the, actual training <clears throat> so in our uh, ceremonial guide training um, first one must uh, go through the the quest first one must quest before you become a guide to questing actually you do it several times but it begins with participation in one of our um, uh, 11 or 12 day I say 11 or 12, because when we do our international one, we add a day, so it's 12 days. Um, <clears throat> but to go through the um, 11 or 12 day village encampment and uh, vision quest, vision fast ceremony, in which then that time period, there's a four day, four night solo. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, a prerequisite to the training. Um, after having done that, if one wishes to continue down this this uh, this particular avenue of uh, of what I call good trouble, then uh, and wanted to uh, actually begin training process to become one of those ceremonial rites of passage guides, um, <clears throat> you could come back and apprentice at another quest. And then there's a, a, a year long training um, that has six different sessions within the training itself. Um, the first session, the first two sessions of the training are focused on um, deep work with medicine wheel cosmology. <clears throat> and I don't mean simply knowing the four directions and about east, west, south, and north, or spring, you know, winter. <laughs> fall and summer. I mean, a, a deeper knowing of, of medicine wheel cosmology that helps you understand somebody's story and where their challenges are uh, based on your conceptualization of the wheel in your head. So you have to, you learn it deeply. When you go through the through the first program, you go through that where we say finding your place on the wheel. So that if if somebody said, uh, told me a story uh, about feeling confused about something and afraid to take action, what I would know immediately is this is likely uh, going to be a ritual that involves either uh, air, mineral, or fire, based on that information. If it is about the courage to take action, it's likely going to be an, a ritual that's going to involve fire as an elemental presence in medicine. If it is about the need to gather more clarity and information before taking action, then it's likely going to be a, a ritual that will involve some aspect of air, wind, mineral, <clears throat> as far as beginning to formulate the clarity needed for action. Um, so that's just one example of one place on the wheel. Um, so we we do a deep dive into <clears throat> uh, a particular kind of medicine wheel cosmology um, and teach that and learn that and uh, be able to uh, give yourself ritual prescriptions and then give other people ritual prescriptions within the training. <clears throat> The next uh, session is what we call Death Lodge. And um, <clears throat> Death Lodge is the preparation work before going up on the mountain. Um, in, a, in a death and rebirth ceremony, um, 
the the conversation begins with death, not with birth, um, because we're beginning to examine our lives and what in when in our life what in our lives are we ready to put down or pick up or let go of um, what what old beliefs old stories we tell ourselves that are ready to to die and like surrendered. <clears throat> And so in Death Lodge work, we do um, what's called ritual process healing work with the person. And we teach the, the guides in the guide program, we teach guides how to do this with people um, as far as guiding them through a, a preparation Death Lodge experience, helping them prepare to go up on the mountain. And that's the second session. The third session is focused on working with the ancestors. As the as I say the um, the third and fourth sessions are really focused on working with the non-human realm that assists us in deepening our relationship. <clears throat> so um, we do work on working with ancestors and understanding how to do that work safely and the difference between well ancestors and unwell dead, and um, <laughs> and another. Um, thing in, in, a, in this day and age where it's it seems very popular to call on other people's ancestors or other deities and, and all these things for support. There's nothing wrong with that. However, overlooking your own ancestors, um, <clears throat> that would be considered treacherous in indigenous <laughs> culture that you would bypass your own ancestors and go start uh, connecting in other uh, realms of, of support before like they would be the first ones. Um, <clears throat> and so we talk about how to do that and ancestral line clearing work and connecting with well ancestors in your lineage <clears throat> and realizing that each one of your, just for simplistic sake, each one of your four lines of, of lineage carries within it certain blessings and certain medicine <laughs> that often has been disrupted uh, due to traumas or, or disasters or difficulties, the flow of that medicine and blessing through those lines has been interfered with. And so isn't moving through to you in a really clear, clean way. Um, <clears throat> and even worse, there are unwell dead that are creating even more issues. So we talk about how to clean that up and begin to access the blessings and the medicine of each of your lines of, of lineage and then forming relationships with these through uh, shamanic journey work with each of uh, like four, two grandmothers, two grandfathers. <clears throat> um, that session is also focused on uh, uh, things we call remote tracking and energy work and uh, how to uh, discern i think another part of an answer i didn't give the you and earlier about discerning kind of information is like when information comes to you energetically or intuitively what are the steps you go through to determine the source of it and the accuracy of it um, and there is a, a process of doing that that uh, as i learned from one of my teachers the first question one asks when when feeling and getting that kind of information you say is this mine is this mine? If it's not yours, then there's a whole another series of questions that begin to, to differentiate the information to see if it's going to be useful. <clears throat> if it is yours, you know, it may be of a symbolic nature or other ways of looking at that's come to you. But there's a way of, of differentiating, organizing, and assimilating that kind of non-ordinary information through uh, learning what your particular higher sensory perceptual channels are <clears throat> i find that um no, people no. being clairvoyant is is way over uh used and that more people um, discover that they are actually kinesthetically uh, have a high sense perception of reading things in their energetic environment through their own body uh, than necessarily sight but you learn those different things, sight, physical body, sound, smell, taste, hearing, like all these different sensory channels of information, high sense information. 
and so how to receive it um, and how to differentiate what's what's what. Um, and that's a part for me, that's a part of guiding. So when you're guiding people in ceremony, it is really important that you have a way of discourse with the with these uh, energetic realities. Um, even simply what we call what they call in psychology the field, which is a, a morphogenic field of energy that that kind of is around a, a, say a group of people um, to where you can feel things within the circle that may not even be yours. Um, and knowing all that's helpful because then you can again, is this mine? It's not what to do with it or how to clear clear your energy field. <clears throat> so that's the third session. The fourth session of the training is um, <clears throat> working with the elementals, fire, water, earth, mineral, uh, air, um, and understanding uh, these elementals have a, a very particular medicinal quality <clears throat> in ritual. I was like to say when you go to the uh, when you go to the pharmacy and you take a prescription and you get the pharmacist's prescription and they give you whatever they give you that on there somewhere say active ingredients and then it has a long word that maybe a couple of you could understand but I never seem to <clears throat> but the active ingredients is what gives the medicine its potency right and that's what it says on there. In ritual, the active ingredients to ritual are the elementals. And they each have a very precise type of elemental uh, medicinal quality. There is a reason why we do uh, work with fire in certain rituals rather than water um, or mineral uh, and air and, and uh, earth. Like each one has different qualities of, of understanding. Um, for instance, um, it would be like doing this kind of work and coming to understand that if somebody sat down in front of you and you were getting ready to do a ritual piece of work with them and they said the words to you, I feel a sensation in my uh, abdomen. And you might ask yourself, all right, is this sensation an emptiness or a pressure? Or tell me the sensation. What, what is the sensation? And in this one case, the person said it's emptiness. And so my mind went to, okay, this is not going to end with a fire ritual very likely. This is going to likely have something to do with earth medicine and maybe even ancestors. And so as we got more into the work, he reaches out and he starts digging his hands in the soil. And as the work unfolds, um, there's a peace connected to ancestors and a disconnection that was lost in his lineage. And, um, and so it ended up being somewhat of a combination of an earth ritual and water ritual that involved a, a grief, grief ceremony. So, um, so you learn the kind of way to assimilate a story that you're given and map it into the medicine wheel and also have a conceptualization of ritual prescription that could be offered. Um, so the deepening into your own personal relationship with the elementals is the full focus of the fifth session. Um, the sixth session is where we do another quest. Um, and different than the first one you would have done where you go through kind of the full uh, model of, of what could be questing for the first time in, in this one, it's a because you're part of a training, you're not training to be a guide, which is a little bit different. Um, we, take, we take you somewhere else in the country and uh, with the group, and, and then we go through a, 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 a bit of an abbreviated version of what you did the first time because we don't need to do all the preparation work because we've been doing it all year. And so you do a quest there. And typically it's in that quest that if you were feeling yourself to go to work, you might check your mic and keep your mic's making a lot of noise. Um, 
So if you, uh, if you are feeling called to this work, um, part of the reason I called this, uh, this particular experience, the um, training and initiation in the art of guiding ceremonial rites of passage, because we can offer you training information and experience. The initiation is what happens on the mountain with you. When you go up and say, am I to do this work? Is this mine to carry? That I can't answer for you. That's between you and the creator. Um, and, and you'll come down knowing or, or having some direction about how you might integrate this into your life. Um, not everybody that goes through these experiences, you know, ends up, you know, guiding people into these experiences. There are musicians, there are coaches where you, you might use part of this experience to guide others, like an office setting. Or um, So that's the fifth session. And the last session is um, what we call the giveaway. And it focuses on integrating and uh, the experience and like, where do you go from here with all of this? And as we as we like to say in the, in the um, in the vision fast or the vision quest ceremony, the giveaway uh, is when is when you come off the mountain. The giveaway is how you live your life um, from from this day forward. That's your giveaway. It's like how you live your life is your giveaway. But we put it into the context of uh, rite of passage and, and also more specifically, what does it mean for you? And your life and what will this look like how do you wish to carry this medicine <clears throat> so that's the six sessions um and i say the the next the uh 23 24 training cycle begins in september um and then ends the following year uh, in i think october um I have the date that date in front of me. And if you're interested in um, if you're just interested in the in the quest and the uh, the um, the vision for the vision quest, um, we have one of those coming up in August. It's kind of like open to the general public and and you could check into that by going to our website. If you're interested in beginning the training in September, um, you would probably want to do the quest in August. Um, so, cause that's the prerequisite. Um, in some situations it would require a, a, a more detailed conversation with me. Um, you might be able to um, postpone the first quest um, as long as you did the next one. Like if the first one didn't work out and you still want to do the training, I would need to talk with you and it might be that we could start you in the training, but you would need to quest at the very next one, which would be March in Spain. Um, so those are the, uh, the, the questing options as far as prerequisites to the training. Um, and as far as learning to guide, uh, you, you certainly learn a lot just by doing, just by going through the experience and being a participant. Um, can give you a lot of that information as well. Um, so any, uh, as, as we're coming to the, around the, the last turn here, any questions about anything you have heard or, or any other questions that things you didn't hear? Silence. You've you've uh, talked people into silence. You're not sure if that's a good thing or not. Good thing. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, Cater. Thank you for your wisdom. I'm oh, always you, so moved by your words, and I'm really looking forward to being a part of this this year coming up. Yeah, excited to have you part of the group. Maybe we'll get get a couple more here, and I see uh, see some in the current group. If, soon. I'll be seeing them in a couple of days. If we have any related questions to training one out, we can always, we can contact you through your website. Yes. If you have other related questions. Um, so the website is, um, well, I think you probably went there to see this, to get on this, but uh, www.rights.com, C-O-U-N-C-I-L.org. 
um, you can schedule a call uh, with me from there, like a free 20 minute call. Um, you can, there's a calendar, you can book it there. Um, my calendar's pretty busy. I would say if you did not see a call soon enough with me, I would send the email to hello at Rites of Passage Council, and that's my assistant, Jess, and just say, you know, I need to talk with someone about the quest, and I can't get a call with Cater for, you know, four weeks or something. Um, we can get you in touch with another one of our guides that can uh, very likely answer your questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And emails, I'm happy to get emails. Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's see another hand up, Sarah. Is your hand up now? Yes, Any other questions? Up. thank you. Um, I have a question about, so when when the guides do take a group out, what is the size of the group? Is it a very small group sometimes or is it a larger group or? Um... Um, the way that I do it is I do a closed container. So it's not a community model in terms of like people from the community just come in and are part, part of the model or part of the, the uh, container. It's a closed community and I limit it to eight questers. Um, training I limit to 12 because it's a teaching environment and a learning environment. But as far as first time experience, I limit it to eight first time questers and four returning apprentices. And usually uh, myself, a co-guide and a cook and a cook apprentice. So usually around 12 to 15 people with eight of those being questers. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Peter, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, Samantha DeRosa, um, well, who's the, what's the youngest age that you've taken someone through a vision quest? I'm just curious. Um, 17, only because I knew them in special permission um, and they seemed mature enough. Um, I typically don't work with adolescents because it's a whole other, as you can imagine, licensing and uh, insurance issues and all that. So I work with adults. Sure. Um, I would say the majority of the people that are drawn to Quest mm -hmm. are typically... Um, kind of the, the second half of your 20s, probably to the first half of your 50s. Seems the, and there's certain points in there, like early 40s, if you know astrology, your first Saturn return, which is around 28, 29, like that's a, that's a real rich time for questing. Early 40s seems to be another one of those, the, the section of that decade. Arena um, position <laughs> <laughs> yeah in the early 50s actually uh, mm -hmm. it's another one of those periods that seemed to pull a lot of people to this to these uh callings yeah what else thank, thank you for you. the question yeah any other questions brandon has his hand up brandon yes driving driving hey, there cater <laughs> wonderful to see you brother good to see you uh it just happened uh, that I just, it's just very kismet the uh, way I landed up on your uh, thing today. So um, <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, it sounds like most of, or at least a lot of what you'll be teaching uh, is based on like Dagara stuff or. No, not actually. Um, uh, my has your mic. If you turn your mic off. Um, no, the 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 things that I focus on are would be considered more pan cultural. So working with ancestors, working with elementals, working with rites of passage as more of pan cultural type of connections. Now. My teachers were, uh, you know, Melodoma uh, from Dogra and also Wood Rocking Bear from Cherokee tradition and then many others from other, but those two primarily. Um, so it's not, it's much more from a pan-cultural perspective than a particular lineage of this thing that Got it. I'm showing you. Um, All right, thank you. It's just, it just sounded very, very, uh, 
Paolo Domic. Yes, well, <laughs> hanging out with him for so many years, I can't help it. Yeah, yeah, well, that's all right. That's a, that's a good thing to have on, on board. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? How should we get end with another another poem? Gator, I'm seeing a question in the chat from Lois if there's an upper age limit to take the program. Um, it would have the more to do if you could physically do it. So I don't know. Uh, that's different ages for different people. Um, as I said, the oldest person that I had complete the training. Um, was 72 and he went on to do other quests um uh, but he he kind of read like a healthy younger 72 year old person um and was was able to do it so i don't know um a specific age it would be more like uh one's personal ability um and, I, and if i if you had some questions about we could have a conversation and i could tell you like um, here's the physical things that you would be experiencing and whether or not you could do that. Um, but yeah, it's it's typical that in a training group, we have people, you know, that range in age from mm, upper 20s to um, early 60s, like that's kind of a, a typical range for, for a training group. Anything else? All right, let's see if I can uh, send you off with a, with a poem here. Um, One of my favorite, favorite Irish poets, David White. It's called Sometimes. Sometimes if you move carefully through the forest, sometimes if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories who could cross a shimmering bed of leaves without making a sound. Sometimes if you move carefully through the forest, breathing like the ones in the old stories could cross a shimmering bed of dry leaves without a sound, you come to a place whose only task is to trouble you with tiny but frightening questions. Conceived out of nowhere, but in this place beginning to lead everywhere. Request to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you are doing it. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have been patiently waiting for you. Questions that have no right to go away. I always like the idea of... Uh, Contrary to popular desire, initiatory passages aren't to give you answers. They're actually to give you better questions, questions that you can that can guide you into a life uh, of uh, responding to them. Um, so thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm going to hang on until everybody's off. If there are any lingering questions, I'll just hang out here for a minute. And yeah, I wish you all well and hope to see some of you, or if not all of you, down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, you. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kater. Thank you, Kater. Thank you so much. Peace and blessings. Peace and blessings. Bye bye. I do have one more question. Great. <laughs> You mentioned something about um, when someone asks about like the seven, the youngest person, 
Um, and you mentioned something about insurance and like how it can be different when, you know, you're, you're working with adults versus, you know, youth. Um, so are you still doing, are you doing like therapy as well, like through insurance or are you, no, you, no? Oh, no okay. it's not, it's not therapy. And, uh, what I was saying, I've worked in, um, in wilderness, uh, wilderness re rehab programs with teenagers for a number of years and also wilderness rehab programs for young adults. Um, I find that uh, even when I worked with the teenager, I loved working with the teenagers. I did not like working with the parents who were not very involved. <laughs> um, and uh, so I just found that that once once teenagers got old enough to to be under their own self agency, um, that that I could have more influence um, and they could make more decisions. Um, so that was just a challenge. And then if, of course there are, there are different uh, requirements to work with adolescents and then adults. Uh, and we're a, a nonprofit organization and with small budgets. So, but come, when it comes to working with teens, I was, I loved it. They're great. And I, and I know some great programs that do work with teens, uh, both, uh, yeah, and be glad to share those if people are interested. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for being on, Anne. Anything uh, you want to answer? Yes. Libby here. I do have another question. Um, I'm way over the age limit. What's <laughs> the age limit? I don't know. I'm <laughs> 74. Okay. And I have been in good health all my life, but mm -hmm. last September, I had an epic fall. I broke my knee, my yeah. left knee, and my right shoulder. Ouch, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this just, I would love to do this, but mm -hmm. I, I feel that I would not possibly be able to. Well, um, under the right guidance and with the right modifications, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, see, it, you know, it could be supported where you could. Um, <clears throat> in our in our Vision Quest program, there's not a there's not a time where you're having to hike with everything on your back. Yeah, base camp is a drive-in base camp. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could. Uh, camp, that would be the only thing. Could you camp in a tent? That'd probably yeah. be the most strenuous mm -hmm. thing. Um, and then the next question is, and there's a medical screening form where it's like, is it a, can you do fasting? Um, and, and there's preparation, there's ceremonies of preparation to help you find some of these things out. And I would encourage you to speak with your doctor to, you know, can you fast mm -hmm. for three or four days? And if not, that can be a modification as well. Um, so there's way to, ways to uh, have you be in the ceremony um, and modify some of the physical uh, things that would that someone you know in their twenties might just not blink at. Yeah. Um, and I've I've had people on uh, CPAP machines. Uh, that go out and they uh, get a little solar panel. Uh, I've taken, uh, because one of my daughters is type one diabetes since early in childhood, I've, I've, I felt confident taking out people uh, with type one. They have to eat, of course, and we check their, there's a way that we check their blue cluster during the solo like regularly. So they're monitoring it, we're monitoring it, but they were able to have to experience. So it's, um, a lot of it is the, the the comfort and the ability of your guide and then uh, certainly adapting certain portions of the experience for yourself mm -hmm. that would that would give you the experience without uh, pushing past too many edges. Mm -hmm. so if you wanted to talk further about uh, what that might look like for yourself, you know, set up a call with me and we'll chat. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, um, there's nothing you've told me that is like, oh no, that wouldn't be possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll 
probably do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're quite welcome, Libby. Anyone else? Hi there. Um, I my name is Sarah. Um, Sarah. Hi. Um, I I met one of your um, the um, gentleman who trained um, with you in art of mentoring in um, Vermont. Mm -hmm. He was in a group um, and spoke about you. And then I have followed you over the last couple of years. Um, and this program sounds like um, just like I'm like made for all of the ways to just be groomed just a little bit further in in all of these areas they're all part of um, um working with el elementals mm -hmm. um spiritual um ancestral cleansing um directions all of these things i'm just like a very baby um, but they're all coming at me from all different directions and um Two years ago, I bought land in Gloucester, um, 26 acres of land in Gloucester, raw land that um, I would love to ha like have um, specifically, I think, for children um, to it's like a, a healing um, place for children to come into um, a level of comfort in um, being held in, in the hands of like the greater mother, um, like their, um, their kind of primary sustainer and, um, and to have, I don't know what, I don't know what's next. Um, but I, um, I know that it's in, um, bringing groups together, community together and, um, okay. So my obstacles are that, um, the 12 days, um, I, I'm solo parenting um, a seven-year-old and I'm wondering what um, uh, I could figure that out with family and things, but um, is there anything or anybody that you've trained um, that is closer to the Massachusetts area that um, might be able to just kind of start so that I could go to this maybe in a year with, with like, I don't know, more, um, more preparation or I just feel like August is a, a there's nothing I want to do more than, than this there is um so nobody comes to uh, I mean I know people up there but they're not running different programs and things um that have trained with me uh we are doing smaller things like shorter venue uh mm -hmm. experiences like essentially there's um in two weeks, um, not this Wednesday, but actually next Wednesday, we have an elemental. Mm. Um, uh, it's part of a Cal Rochelle divination training, but you can take session one and two as standalone. And session one is a elemental immersion. Uh, and it's very similar to the fifth training, I mean, the fourth training session of the guide training. Mm -hmm. Um, even though it's focused on divination work, but we do the same elemental rituals. Um, so there are, if you looked on the website, you you would see shorter things like that's a a Wednesday evening at uh, afternoon to Sunday at noon kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it's um, in in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything we're offering right now are either is either here in Asheville, North Carolina, around this area, or um, like over over in Spain next year we have a program, but um, so yeah, there's there's an ancestral grief ritual weekend that's even a shorter. It's like a Thursday, Friday, uh, Thursday night through Sunday. Um, that's down here in July 13 to 16. So there are shorter versions of parts of what I talked about without the whole training experience. Okay. Anything else before we sign off? All right. Well, thank you all again for joining us and I wish you well. And um, I look forward to seeing you some down the road. Good to see you, Ginger and Chris, Ryan, you know, people I've been in circle with here that I still see, Patty. 
and of course Brandon, yeah, some some uh, some people daring to show up again. Peter, I had another question. Yeah. Peter, I had another question. What's that, Brandon? Um, people who've like, uh, well, I did the uh, uh, guide training with uh, Stephen and Meredith about, I don't know, 23 years ago or something. Yeah. And I've put a couple of people out on the mountain and have some experience. I'm just wondering if there's anywhere to plug in to any of what you're doing as like an apprentice or I'm just totally uh, impressed by the depth of your experience and knowledge in different things. And I'd like to soak some of it in. Um, I don't think I can, I haven't looked at the website, but I'm pretty sure I can't afford the full training, but I was wondering if there's any way to work into something like that. Why don't I take a look at all the different offerings on the website and then set up a call and let's chat. Okay. That Very would good. be Thank you. a good way to do it. Okay. All right. All right, well, I've got to go uh, get some dinner now. And uh, thank you all for joining us. And everybody go well.